Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is August 17th, 2022. Welcome to the RUHS Innovations webinar. Uh, today we have a presentation on NPX or monkeypox and Riverside County's efforts uh, towards it. We have our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Shabinsky. She is a double boarded preventative medicine and lifestyle medicine physician serving as our deputy public health officer for Riverside County Public Health. She serves as an assistant professor for Loma Linda University's Department of Preventative Medicine and School of Public Health. And she's an editor for the American Journal of Preventative Medicine Focus. Uh, Dr. Shavinsky is coming up on one year working at Riverside County after working for the CDC as an epidemic uh, intelligence service officer for over two years. While at the CDC, she participated in multiple deployments for the COVID pandemic and was the lead author for CDC's interim guidance on post-COVID conditions, also known as long COVID. She completed her undergraduate medical education at the University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine, her internship at Lehigh Valley Health Network, and her specialty residency training in preventative medicine, as well as master's degree in public health at Loma Linda University. In Riverside County, Dr. Javinsky has served as the medical advisor for the COVID-19 response, as well as for the monkeypox response or MPX response. Also as the TB controller, treating patients with tuberculosis throughout the county, and she oversees the division of infectious disease, um, as well as community health planning and health equity, as well as the undergraduate and graduate medical student training programs. Speaking, on, uh, speaking today on Riverside County's MPX efforts, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jennifer Shavinsky. Thank you, Dr. Bacho. And I'm excited to be with everybody today and to discuss some updates around MPX. Um, you might hear the terms monkeypox, MPX, MPOX. There's a shift to using the MPX or MPOX language um, uh, in, in an effort to destigmatize the, the term, terminology. Um, and so throughout the presentation, I will do my best to also refer to it as MPX or MPOX. Um, and so as, as Dr. Dr. Bacho announced, Dr. Shavinsky, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. It's um, probably my third or so innovation webinar on different topics, um, and it's always a pleasure to be able to join all of you. If you have questions throughout, feel free to put it in the chat. If there's any that um, seem like they could be quickly answered during the course of the chat, or if it's a clarification, Dr. Bacha will call those out to me so that way we can um, answer those on the spot. Otherwise, there'll also be time for questions at the end. So today, we're gonna talk a bit about epidemiology um, and what we're seeing with the monkeypox cases. I'm um, talking about symptoms and spread or transmission, testing and reporting, treatment considerations, isolate, isolation and infection control, vaccines, prevention, and then open up for a Q&A session. It's a lot of material. We might be going through it a little bit quickly, um, but you'll also be able to refer back to the slides. And a lot of the, the material is also cited below at the different um, websites, so you'll be able to go back to those if that's, if that's helpful to you. So moving into the background, what is MPX? I'm sure all of you have, have now heard a bit about it. Uh, it's a rare disease caused by infection with the uh, monkeypox virus or MPX virus. Related to the smallpox virus, although generally less severe and much less contagious, it's not related, however, to chickenpox, herpes, simplex virus, or of course, not to COVID-19. Um, here are some pictures uh, on, on the right, but we'll be looking a little bit more at pictures as well. There are different presentations depending on the stage um, uh, of, the, of the lesion and uh, the progression. Uh, and it might look slightly different on different skin tones and with different severities. You might see you know, anything from one or two, a couple lesions to uh, something that's a little bit more disseminated. Let's talk about epidemiology. So first, talking about um, what the case defi definitions are. So what does it mean when we're seeing a suspect case, a probable case, confirmed case? You might see that we're reporting probable and confirmed cases. And oftentimes we get questions about, well, what does that really mean? So when we're talking about a suspect case, that is uh, an individual has a, uh, reported a new characteristic rash um, or meets one of the epidemiologic criteria and has a high clinical suspicion for um, MPX. Um, and so more about the epidemiological criteria can also be found uh, at, at the website, but it's uh, things like having travel to an area where there's um, uh, uh, outbreaks of MPX or having um, uh, 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 being uh, among a group uh, of men who have sex with men, things along those lines. Um, 
in, in addition with um, uh, the clinical suspicion or uh, the new rash. In terms of a probable case, that's when we move into the um, lab um, components. So it's no suspicion of an other recent orthopox virus and demonstration of orthopox virus DNA by PCR of a clinical specimen um, or some other different um, lab mechanisms. Uh, the ones that, that are happening more routinely is the PCR testing. Um, so when we're moving into probable case, that means that it's it's been swabbed. We have lab um, support for it of a, a virus that's within the orthopox family. Of course, we know, unfortunately, there aren't any other orthopox viruses that are currently circulating, um, just the, the, the um, monkeypox virus or the MPX virus. A confirmed case, so that, that was especially early on, that was happening happening more so through confirmation at the CDC, where they would then isolate the MPX virus. But that said, whether it's a probable or confirmed, we treat it uh, similarly, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, that. Um, again, that's because the only circulating orthopox virus right now at this time is MPX. Um, and so from a clinical standpoint, we can think of that as confirmed, even if in the epidemiological sense, we might call that a probable versus a confirmed case little more epi. So we're seeing increased cases internationally. These increased cases are reported in areas where MPX hadn't been commonly seen before, uh, internationally in the US, across Europe. As of August 16th, there are over 38,000 cases of MPX internationally, including 12 deaths, um, and that time point beginning in May of uh, 2022. So um, in this recent out outbreak, um, in the U.S., there have been uh, 12,689 cases, um, and uh, one identified risk factor has been male-to-male -male sexual contact at this, at this time, um, as well as uh, uh, recent travel that might be a, a associated uh, at, as well. Uh, and, and of course, we'll talk a little bit more about this. This doesn't mean that that's the exclusive way that people can get it, have gotten it, or could get it, um, but it just has been linked in the early stages of, of these outbreaks. The CLAD recently identified in Europe and the US is considered CLAD2. So uh, prior, uh, similar to MPX, how it was re renamed, the CLADs have also been renamed by WHO. Um, and so you might see a switch in that language uh, as well. And, and that uh, the, the CLAD2 tends to cause less severe disease compared to the, the one. Also seeing increased cases in California. So as of August 16th, um, there are um, 1,945 cases um, across the state. Among those with data, um, uh, uh, sexual history uh, of MSM is, is predominant. Um, male is also predominant and mostly mild disease. Um, you can see the epi curve here on the right and we see how that is going up. Um, where you see the gray bar towards the, the back end. Um, the reason that there's the, the larger gray bar uh, around that time period is to denote that data is still being reported for that time period. So while we would like to say, oh, look, it's dropped off, really what that's reflecting is um, data that's still coming in that will populate for that time period. Risk factors include international travel, close intimate contact with a known uh, MPX case, participation in venues with multiple sex partners, including bathhouses. Some other demographic and additional data um, here from uh, looking at the CDPH, the California data. So um, you can see where we are. I just pulled the top 10 in terms of number of cases. Numbers a little out of date, um, but not, not, not too out of date. And I'll talk, talk about our most recent numbers, but just to show you know, where we're falling in the, the numbers uh, in terms of the counties, we are here in the top 10, unfortunately, uh, of counties with the highest uh, amount of cases. In terms of age, we're seeing it primarily between the ages of 25 and you know 55. That 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 group, um, uh, predominantly male, as, as mentioned. And um, in terms of uh, race, ethnicity, uh, white, Hispanic, or Latino, although also uh, seen in Black or African American. And then um, in terms of sexual orientation, primarily gay, lesbian, same gender loving. Um, and in terms of hospitalization, 96% um, have not required hospitalization. One thing to take in, into account when looking at this data, um, really what this reflects is um, those that are being reported as confirmed or probable, which means that there would have to have been lab tests done. So something to think about is whether or not there are some um, disparities in terms of who has access to testing, which might affect 
for instance, where we see the Caucasian predominance, um, it, it isn't clear at this time whether perhaps other groups are just not having uh, equal access to testing, or there might be some other hidden disparities similarly for those who uh, um, uh, identify as transgender. Similarly, so whether or not there are some disparities that are playing a role there. MPX in Riverside County, and you might recognize this gentleman on the right <laughs> as Dr. Leung. Um, so that's a, a picture of him signing the, the public health emergency declaration. Um, but so as of August 17th, we have 107 cases in the county. Almost all are men, most between the ages of 25 and 64. So all of that mirroring what we're seeing in the California data. Most are from Coachella Valley area. Um, and just some um, notable dates, May 24th, we sent out um, our first public health advisory to healthcare providers and posted on our disease control website to try and get our healthcare providers um, uh, up to date on, on um, uh, what's happening in, in the county and, and what can be done around uh, MPX. On June 14th, we received our first limited supply of smallpox vaccination, which is the Genios that's being used for MPX um, in Riverside County. At that time, our first allocation was 20 doses, so really quite small. June 21st, um, we had our report of our first probable case. On the 29th, um, we then created our MPX um, webpage. On July 5th, we had the confirmation of our first MPX uh, case in Riverside County. Uh, July 28th, we received our first local shipment of TPOX uh, on August 8th. Um, we have Dr. Leung there signing the public health emergency declaration. And on the 15th, um, the Board of Super Supervisors ratified that proclamation of local health emergency. So now onto symptoms and spread or transmission. So how does monkeypox spread or MPX? It's spread from infected humans, animals, and materials contaminated with the virus, thought to be most contagious when symptoms like a rash are present, making it also at the same time easier to control spread um, by uh, individuals with a rash isolating from others to prevent further spread. Some additional images that you see here. Um, so how might somebody come in contact with uh, MPX? Primarily through close personal, often skin to skin contact with people who have MPX symptoms, such as rash and sores. Uh, that's the primary route we're seeing, although it's also possible to, to, to get it through touching materials used by a person with MPX that haven't been cleaned, like clothing or bedding. And then less uh, commonly or less likely, but also possible respiratory secretions, like talking, coughing, sneezing, or breathing during prolonged close face-to-face -face contact. And that one seems to be, at least in the current outbreak, more so um, things like kissing, where it's really close face-to-face -face contact. It's not spread um, through casual conversations or walking by somebody with MPX, like in a grocery store or touching items like doorknobs. Terms of signs and symptoms and how it starts. So it might start with flu-like symptoms, um, the prodromal symptoms, fever, low energy, swollen lymph nodes, um, general body aches. Incubation period is considered to be somewhere between three and 17 days. Um, some uh, people with MPX may experience all or only a few of these symptoms or really none of these prodromal symptoms. That's what we've seen in the most recent outbreak is, is some report not even experiencing any of these. Um, although most people have been found uh, to present with a rash or source, but a note on that one is that um, the only way that we're really con confirming is through lab testing of lesions. So therefore, it's hard to say at this time and, and more data will be needed um, to evaluate whether it's possible for somebody to have MPX and not present with a rash or perhaps uh, only present with, you know, one lesion or something like that, very minimal that they might not even, you know, notice that. Within one to three days of the prodromal symptoms, uh, or although sometimes longer, um, uh, typically a person can develop a rash or sores. Um, sores will go through several stages, including scabs before healing, and they can look like pimples or blisters, and um, they may be um, painful and, 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 and itchy. Um, the rash or sores may be located on or near the genitals or anus, um, but could also be in other areas like the hands, uh, feet, chest, and face. And they may be limited to one part of the body. And we know that this is one of the conditions where people can get it on their palms and soles, um, but uh, the absence on the palms or soles wouldn't determine um, that, it, that, that it isn't MPX, for instance. Can look, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this too, that could also look like other conditions uh, as well. So um, it, it's, it's one that, that, that might be more challenging to identify as MPX versus um, something else. Um, but the, that's where the history and thinking about the epi criteria might help you. 
So just the lesions typically develop simultaneously. Um, so typically you're seeing them in similar stages and they evolve together on any given part of the body. The evolution of lesions progresses through macular, papular, vesicular to pustular before scabbing over and um, the uh, discrimination. So um, this talks a little bit about um, how you might you know, first see uh, some lesions form on the tongue and the mouth. Um, then you might uh, see macules, papules, vesicles, pustules, uh, scabs. The rash may look just similar to, well, other rashes, but also other STIs. Um, the clinical presentation um, may look something similar to syphilis or herpes, uh, LGV, or other etiologies of proctitis. Um, and the diagnosis of an STI does not exclude MPX. In fact, around a third of the cases that have been reported, they've, they've found that um, the, the individual also had a concurrent STI at the same time. So something to be mindful of. Um, if, if there's a concern, is there, if there's a thought that it could be MPX, the best best thing to do is to just test it. Testing and reporting. So in terms of reporting, we ask that we re report suspect probable confirmed cases um, to uh, public health within a day of identification. Um, here's a phone number. I'm sure you, you're all probably um, familiar with re reporting cases and, and, and uh, perhaps at times of those conversations with Barbara Cole. Um, and uh, so similarly with MPX, um, would require reporting. This becomes uh, particularly important if, if you're suspect. So we do get um, through ELR lab reports back that will do some reporting, but oftentimes if the test, the result is lagging um, and we don't find out until the test comes back, what that means is we're losing a key window of time to do contact tracing and post-exposure prophylaxis um, for contacts. If there's certainly if there's somebody that seems to um, be fitting all the criteria uh, of, of monkeypox that, that we have high clinical suspicion, um, we would want to know so that way we can then do that contact tracing and 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 try and slow the spread. Um, in terms of uh, testing uh, done via commercial labs is one route. That's the preferred route. I know at uh, RUHS um, they're using both LabCorp and and Quest. Quest uh, on inpatient side, LabCorp on outpatient side. Um, so sending via uh, via these um, commercial labs is the preferred route. Um, and then via public health, uh, uh, if commercial lab is not possible. So we are assisting um, for some high priority samples or if uh, uh, another location where, where commercial labs are not possible. And that uh, situation, we send a courier, they transport to San Bernardino Public Health Lab, which is the approved LRN lab. And on the website, we have some more information about testing guidance. Um, and this just talks through, um, uh, you know, how, how to conduct the, the testing. Um, and so essentially it's being sending dry swabs of lesions using sterile nylon, polyester, decrin um, swabs with plastic or aluminum shaft. Um, we should be sampling more than one lesion. For each of the commercial labs, they might have a specific guide on how they prefer to take samples. And so you should be following their guidance for the commercial labs. If it's coming to us, then what we're asking for is two swabs um, from each from each from two lesions. So that would be four swabs total, two from each lesion. You would be vigorously swabbing or brushing lesions um, with uh, two separate style dry swabs, and then um, uh, and sampling uh, lab uh, label and store the swabs for us to pick up. Um, the key the key thing here is that you don't need to lance the lesions. Um, in studies, it, it appears that uh, just swabbing the outside, if it's swabbed vigorously, has enough viral load for us to test it. Um, and uh, in fact, it might open up additional opportunities for, for the person to get a secondary infection, as well as pose more risk to yourself. Um, and, and so the lancing of, of the lesion is not necessary for this test. Testing locations. So what we're telling um, patients to do is to talk, ask their primary care provider about testing, um, that they should be testing primarily through a primary care provider if that's made available to them. There's here are some other institutions that are also doing testing and we've gotten uh, RUHS up and running in terms of testing too. But if anybody on this call is somebody who, who thinks they might be doing testing and aren't exactly sure how to do that, that's something um, definitely to follow up with, with us and, and we can help work through it. And on the RUH side, there's, there might be a, a clinical contact who can also so help uh, walk through that process. In terms of treatment, um, what treatments are there? Um, many people infected with MPX virus have a mild self limiting disease course without specific therapy. As you saw, uh, almost greater than 96% ha haven't required hospitalization. Um, and management and treatment of MPX disease includes non-specific, often non-specific supportive care and treatment of symptoms. 
Um, ha however, there is also the antiviral uh, drugs like TPOX. We'll talk a little bit more about that. That can be used for people at risk of severe disease um, or those that are having a, a, a severe presentation. So first, um, what the recommendation is, is, is to, it's important to address pain and the symptoms. Um, and that often can help people keep people out of the hospital or help uh, discharge them sooner. Pain seems to be a leading reason for, for inpatient admission uh, for MPX. So we wanna assess pain, uh, recognize um, pain that might exist from muc mucosal lesions, um, otherwise that might not otherwise be present on physical exam, um, use topical and system systemic strategies to manage pain, SITS baths, salt water gar gargles, topical steroids, lidocaine, over the counters, NSAIDs and acetaminophen, um, if needed prescription pain relievers. So some patients report um, a quite a you know, pain benefit from um, gabapentin, uh, we all know our feelings on opioids, but as indicated for pain control, um, seek consultation with pain specialists for refractory cases, still softeners for proctitis, especially if opioid analgesia um, uh, is prescribed, uh, and then stay in contact with patients to assess pain control and adjust as needed. Um, uh, and then TPOX may be indicated um, even just for pain control itself. If, if somebody's in a, a, a severe uh, pain or they have lesions in sensitive areas. So we'll talk a little bit more about TPOX and who should get it. Um, so uh, it's approved to, to treat smallpox. Uh, of course, we're using it now through an IND as well for, for MPX. Um, uh, and uh, because of that IND process, um, there's some paperwork associated with that. Um, uh, but uh, uh, that uh, is something that we can also help um, providers work through and institutions have been able to work through in order to be able to get TPOX to their patients. Um, it's available as a 14-day course of oral capsules um, or IV injection. Oral is preferred. If needed, we do have IV as an, avail as an option, but oral uh, actually has better uh, absorption and is, is, is the preferred. Um, and uh, it has capsule. It's a capsule that could be opened up as well. If somebody, though, has some level of dysphagia or, or uh, inability to swallow, IV is available. And then we would just try and switch them off IV as quickly as we could back to oral. Um, for children weighing uh, less than 28.6 pounds, as I mentioned, capsules can be opened and they could be, the food could be mixed, mixed with food. Um, important uh, is uh, there's also, a, when patients are taking the medications, um, they're supposed to be taking it um, after a very a, a high fat meal. Um, so there's more information about that also. So here in Riverside County, healthcare providers can reach out to public health for help submitting correct forms. And there may be a point per person at RUHS at well that can help um, with that. And perhaps we could talk a little bit about that more. Maybe Dr. Rachman knows a little bit more about the specific point person that can help with that. Um, combination of approaches um, that we're taking, we're supplying partnering facilities with TPOX on hand to prescribe and dispense. This is our preferred is to be able to um, get TPOX into, for instance, the hospital or CHCs or other locations such that it's pre-positioned to be able to be used, dispensed um, when needed, and then it doesn't need to be um, uh, requested from public health in that, in that moment. You would already have it uh, on site. Um, uh, uh, in addition, there's also uh, an opportunity um, to, to use TPOX for empiric treatment. So we don't necessarily need to wait for lab tests to come back if it is a classic case uh, with, with clinical uh, picture of lining up. We also have a courier service to provide TPOX to facilities not able to dispense without supply on hand. Um, and uh, we've been encouraging partnerships between healthcare facilities and pharmacies to enable efficient prescription and dispensing and providing IV TPOX to inpatient settings if needed. Some of our um, treatment uh, locations, so uh, that includes uh, uh, RUHS now as, as well as coming on board for um, treatment too. So now who is at risk for severe disease? Who, who are these people that would be fitting in that TPOX category? People with immunocompromise. So HIV, that, there's a lot number of people that are with HIV that are within this uh, outbreak. So you might see that. Uh, there are autoimmune diseases, immunocompromised. Uh, children under the age of eight, um, those that have a uh, history or presence of certain skin conditions like atomic, atopic dermatitis, eczema, burns, epitigo, et cetera. Um, and uh, women who are breastfeeding um, or, or pregnant. And there's more information here, um, such as, for example, somebody who has severe pain, somebody who has lesions in sensitive areas, like near their eyes, for instance, they might also be candidates. Um, a little bit more information about managed MPX and, and people with HIV. So vaccination, medical treatment, close monitoring are priority. This is based off a, a new, guidance, new guidance that CDC has put out. 
We want to uh, consider both viral suppression and CD4 count in weighing the risk of severe outcomes. ART and opportunistic infection prophylaxis should be continued, so not stopped it, it, um, it for treatment of, of, of MPX. People taking antiretrovirals for HIV PrEP or, or PEP uh, should be continued. Um, for HIV diagnosed uh, coincident with MPX, CDC recommends starting uh, ART as soon as possible. Um, and then assessing drug and in, drug drug interactions with any antiretrovirals used to treat or prevent HIV, as well as with meds used to treat, to prevent or treat HIV related opportunistic infections. So um, you may be familiar with the Liverpool uh, drug interaction checker from yes COVID and checking for Paxlovid. Similarly, that's also possible to check the HIV drug interactions um, with, for instance, TPOX. Some considerations for MPX in people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, so preterm delivery, spontaneous pregnancy loss, and stillbirth have been reported in, in um, women with NPX. Um, so they would, uh, should be prioritized for medical treatment if needed, um, including for TPOX because of that probable increased risk of severe disease and risk of transmission to the fetus during pregnancy or to, new, or to the newborn um, by close contact and risk of severe infection in newborns. Um, close monitoring for severe disease and pregnancy complications is important. Uh, TPOX would be considered the first line antiviral. Um, no human data on use of TPOX in pregnancy or effect on milk production at this time. Um, so it's based on weighing, weighing risks and benefits. Um, no specific fetal effects though were observed in animal studies. Some more information about pregnancy and pediatrics. Some considerations in children. Treatment should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for children and adolescents with suspect, suspected or confirmed MPX or at risk for severe disease or develop complications of MPX. So the risk criteria is similar to the adult risk criteria. TPOX is a first-line med medication. Um, children and adolescents with exposures to people with suspected or confirmed MPX may also be eligible for post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP under EUA. So this pre previously was through IND. When the switch came um, for vaccines to also be allowed through an intradermal route, we'll talk more about that, um, there was also an allowance under EUA for um, vaccination for children, which makes that process a little bit easier. Isolation and infection control. Uh, isolation recommendations. So MPX can spread from the time symptoms start until all symptoms have resolved, including full healing of the rash with formation of a fresh layer of skin. That can take two to four weeks. That's a long time. Um, and so um, we could talk a little bit more about um, case management and, and social work and what patients might need in order to help them to be successful in their isolation. Of course, this might pose a challenge to people who are experiencing homelessness. This might pose a challenge um, to individuals who are dependent on their day-to-day -day work to bring home money to, to be able to afford for housing, food, and other things. So something for us to keep in mind. If people are uh, unable to remain fully isolated throughout the illness, the so CDC uh, breaks it down into, you know, during the time when they're symptomatic with uh, respiratory symptoms, that's where we're, you know, um, a little bit stronger on the isolation, more, more complete isolation recommendations, meaning that they're remaining isolated and staying home unless they're seeing a healthcare provider or um, are in an emergency. During that time, they want to be avoiding close physical contact with people and animals, covering lesions with clothing, with, uh, with clothing or bandages if they are around people in their house, for instance, uh, wearing a well-fitting mask, and of course, avoiding public transportation if they're, if they're leaving for a health appointment or an emergency. Once the respiratory symptoms go away, um, and if they are uh, then covering lesions, there may be some ability for them to, uh, uh, again, cover lesions um, and uh, leave the house for, for needed things, but minimizing um, time outside of the, outside of, uh, the house. Um, until all signs and symptoms of MPX illness have fully resolved. So that, that means they shouldn't be, you know, returning to work as, as usual or, or being in close contact with people, um, uh, but um, they might be going to the grocery store quickly to pick something up, for instance. Um, but it, during that time, they should still be avoiding sharing utensils or cups. Items should be cleaned and disinfected before use by others. They shouldn't share items that have been worn or handled with other people or animals. Um, they should launder and disinfect items that have been worn or handled and surfaces that have been touched by a lesion, wash hands often, avoid close contact, including sexual or close intimate contact with other people and avoid crowds and congregate settings. So isolation considerations during pregnancy. Uh, fortunately, we do not have any um, pregnant women in, in the county at this point, um, but in preparation um, uh, and thinking through, you know, in terms of if something like that were to happen, um, knowing that the risk of neonatal tr uh, transmission with close contact 
and potential for severe uh, disease uh, in newborns is, is present. There is that risk. Um, direct contact between a uh, patient with MPX and newborn is not advised. So what would be recommended is separate, separate rooms for the newborn to prevent transmission while infectious. If the patient does choose to have contact with the newborn during the infectious period, then strict precautions should be taken, including no direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. So during contact, newborns should be fully clothed or swaddled, and after contact, clothing or blankets should be removed and replaced. Gloves and a fresh gown should be worn by the patient at all time, uh, with all visible skin below the neck covered. Soiled linen should be removed from the area. Patients should wear well-fitted source, source control like medical masks during the visit. And in terms of discharging planning, that should account for the duration of isolation and the ability to strictly adhere to isolation precautions and availability of alternative um, caregivers. More information about pregnancy down here. Um, additional clinical considerations in pregnancy. So in-person in in, in -person visitors should be limited to those essential for patients' care and well-being. Visitors should have no direct skin-to-skin -skin contact with the patient. They should wear appropriate PPE, and they should not thereafter go to other locations within the facility like the newborn nursery. So we know oftentimes, you know, a spouse or, or, or somebody might come see uh, the, the person who's who just had the baby, and then they might go see the new, newborn nursery. We do not want that, that cross back and forth. Um, may experience increased stress. The, 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 the person who recently had the baby might experience increased stress because of separation from the newborn and postpartum de depression symptoms may be worsened. So providers are, are encouraged to share resources with patients about coping with stress. Breastfeeding should be delayed until um, uh, they're able to be removed off of isolation. And uh, may, they may need additional support from a lactation provider to initiate and maintain milk production and avoid breast infection while MPX lesions are healing. Uh, breast uh, milk expressed from a patient who's symptomatic or isolated should be discarded, shouldn't be used for breastfeeding and um, uh, for feeding the baby and to avoid inadvertently exposing an infant and healthcare, uh, a healthy caregiver can feed pasteurized donor milk and formula other options. Um, again, here's a link. I'm not sure how I got carried to the right here, but I'll fix that on my next slides. <laughs> Uh, healthcare settings, precautions for preventing uh, MPX transmission. The standard precautions should be applied for all patient care, including for patients with suspected MPX. Um, uh, so uh, not too much different there. If a patient uh, seeking care suspected of MPX though, infection prevention and control personnel should be notified. Uh, activities that could resuspend dry material from lesions um, uh, should be avoided, like use of portable fans or dry dusting, sweeping, vacuuming, in order to avoid resuspending the, the, the material from lesions. Here's some links uh, down here about infection prevention. Uh, in terms of patient placement, a uh, patient with suspected or confirmed MPX infection, uh, they can be placed in a single occupancy, single person room. Um, uh, uh, an isolation room um, or negative pressure is not required. Um, single occupancy is, is fine. Door should be kept uh, closed um, if it's safe to do so. Patients should have a dedicated bathroom. And then when they're being transported, um, uh, transport movement of the patient outside the room should be limited to medically essential purposes. And if the patient is transported, they should use well forwarding source control, so medical mask, and have uh, any exposed skin uh, lesions covered with a sheet or gown. For procedures like intubation or extubation, or any procedures that are likely to spread oral secretions, they should be those should be performed in an airborne infection isolation room. In terms of PPE used by uh, healthcare personnel, ideally should include gown, gloves, eye protection, uh, and uh, N95. Uh, in, in particular, if any of these uh, airborne uh, type procedures are, are being done, like the intubation, et cetera. Environmental infection control. So standard cleaning and disinfection procedures should be performed using an EPA registered hospital grade disinfectant. Um, soiled laundry uh, should be handled in accordance with standard practice, um, but should avoid uh, contact um, contacting directly the, any material that might have been touched by le a lesion. Certainly shouldn't be shake, shaked out or, or anything like that. Try and avoid dispersing infectious material. Um, activities like dry dusting, sweeping, vacuuming should be avoided, and wet cleaning methods are preferred. More information down here. In terms of monitoring for those that have been exposed to MPX in the community, um, they can continue their routine daily activities. It's not like a quarantine, like what we saw in early days in COVID, for instance. They can go to work, they can go to school, as long as they're not having any signs or symptoms of MPX. They, can monitor, they should monitor for health signs or symptoms consistent with MPX for 20 days after their last um, exposure. Uh, it's uh, recommended to do a thorough skin and mouth uh, exam and good lighting. That can be um, done by the person themselves, caregiver or healthcare provider, but just that they should be keeping an eye on, on their body for any lesions that might come up, including in the general area in this area. 
If a rash occurs, they should follow the isolation and prevention practices. They should isolate, the, the rash should be tested, et cetera, if, if it looks um, like it could be consistent with uh, monkeypox. And, if, uh, and then of course, if the results are negative, if it, if it no longer seems as if it's um, monkeypox, then you know, discussion about releasing from isolation. Um, if other signs or symptoms are present, but no rash, um, an individual uh, can isolate for five days after the development of those um, signs or symptoms. So if they're having a prodromal and it seems like it might be an oncoming of monkeypox, um, if the five days have passed and at that point they're not having any lesions, um, it seems like it could have been attributed to something else, then um, released. If a new sign or symptom develops, though, um, at any point during the 20 day monitoring period, then again, you know, the five day isolation would be considered. Um, and uh, the, the isolation could be uh, stopped um, if um, the healthcare provider um, uh, or public health, if, 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 if it's considered that the, the rash or signs or symptoms are not due to monkeypox or if there's a clear alternative diagnosis. The decision on when to end symptom monitoring and home isolation, either during the 28, 21 day period or during a five day extension, um, uh, can be made with input from public health authorities. Um, although uh, typically it's not a situation where it's like TB, where we're you know having a, a, like an official documentation or official release from isolation, um, and so uh, healthcare providers are able to um, uh, uh, help with making those decisions. And if they have questions, of course, they can contact us. As a precaution, patients with exposures uh, shouldn't donate blood, cells, tissue, breast milk, or semen while, while they're in this monitoring phase. Um, and uh, although organ uh, transport, transportation um, uh, uh, can be considered um, uh, to be done if it's uh, following appropriate risk benefit consideration. So it's not an, an absolute no there. Uh, more information about monitoring here. Um, so this just goes through um, what the recommendations are based off of the degree of exposure. So we're talking about monitoring and we're talking about what that might look like, but I also we have to consider, well, what do we consider be, uh, an exposure and what would be a higher degree of exposure versus a lower? So a high would be, you know, skin to skin contact. So contact between exposed individuals, broken skin or mucous membranes with the skin lesions or body fluids from a person with monkeypox. So, or, or having sexual contact or um, uh, uh, contact between exposed individuals, broken skin or mucous membranes with materials that have contact with skin lesions or body fluids of a person with monkeypox. So things that we would kind of consider anyway, you know, that, that sounds like that would be high risk. In that uh, situation, we um, they, they should be monitoring and there are also recommendations for post-exposure prophylaxis. We'll talk more about vaccine. Um, and, and that particularly within um, the, the four to 14 days following the, the exposure. If it's an intermediate um, degree of exposure, so being within six feet for a total of three hours of an unmasked person with monkeypox without wearing a surgical mask or a respirator, contact between an exposed individual's uh, intact skin with the skin lesions or body fluid from a person with monkeypox. So some of these that are um, uh, uh, less um, clear, you know, direct skin to skin um, uh, contact would fa fall within this uh, intermediate category. Monitoring still, um, yes, would be recommended. Um, PEP case by case. So we're, we're um, the, the PEP is, uh, is being prioritized for these high risk kinds of exposures may also fall into the intermediate, um, but that would be more uh, dependent on the situation. Lower risk PEP is, is no longer part of the, the recommendation or consider or as much of a consideration. Um, monitoring, yes, um, but that's more like entering the, the um, living space of a person with monkeypox, um, regardless of whether the person is, uh, is present and in the absence of any um, uh, any of the other ex exposures. So just you know uh, enter entering that living space um, without having any skin to skin, without having uh, you know very close uh, contact or having no exposure then, you know, if, if they've had no, none exposure at all, then there would be no monitoring or PEP. Talking vaccines. So is there a vaccine for MPX? So Genios live vaccine produced from an attenuated non-replicating orthopox uh, virus um, and uh, contains no material of direct animal origin. It, it can be used um, uh, in people with HIV immunocompromised, there's no CD4 cutoffs for safely receiving the, the vaccine. Um, but as many have, have probably heard, there is limited supply of the vaccine throughout the country, throughout the state, throughout the county. And CDC has put forth equity recommendations for vaccines. And, and, and that is uh, th those recommendations are ones that were also um, uh, 
uh, taking into consideration for our uh, vaccine strategies as well, um, in terms of engaging people from affected communities and planning for vaccine programs, using non-stigmatizing and plain language, reiterating uh, privacy of information and how data will be used, um, engaging diverse partners, um, bringing vaccines to where people are through pop-up events and mobile outreach. So we have been providing uh, vaccines um, at uh, locations where uh, there's known to be um, uh, uh, either sex work or um, uh, people engaging in uh, uh, anonymous sex, um, leveraging clinical venues that serve people who have historically had less access to primary care. Of course, CHC is a big part of that. Um, as well as sexual health clinics, transgender health clinics, pharmacies, use them on multiple channels um, to advertise and book appointments. So we have our vaccine interest form. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Minimizing the use of systems that are first come, first serve. Uh, typically, those do not help with equity because those that have the know, those that have the privilege, those that have the information are able to get in, and those that are have uh, higher disparities aren't able, don't have as much access to the information. They often get left behind. So uh, these are some things that we're considering when we're, we're building our, our recommendations. Uh, what can the vaccine be used for? PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and so uh, again, uh, that would be within uh, a four to 14 days. Um, uh, and the sooner the better of an exposure in order to potentially prevent MPX, but oftentimes not, it doesn't necessarily prevent disease, but uh, it reduces the symptoms. Importantly, once somebody already has symptoms of MPX, once they already have a rash, they are out of the window to be able to get the vaccine. Then we're talking about treatments and whether or not they qualify for TPOX. But vaccine, even if they're within the 14-day window and they have a rash, they are no longer eligible. It's not considered to be effective. Um, then pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, uh, and so this is, again, is, is off some data uh, looking at smallpox vaccine uh, at the um, effectiveness uh, in preventing MPX. Um, at the current time, CDPH suggests a prioritizing first doses while supply continues to increase. Um, so it's actually a two-dose series. So um, 28 days apart um, with some uh, grace period um, uh, of, of seven days after. Uh, so um, instead of oftentimes instead of scheduling out the second appointment like we've done with COVID, um, we would um, stretch out to um, the end of the grace period. Um, and uh, with consideration, though, for those that are immunocompromised, that then then we would um, uh, uh, still be prioritizing those for their second dose. Um, uh, counties may have different approaches to PrEP based on available supply, um, and uh, most healthcare providers are not recommended to be vaccinated for a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So those that are working in the ED or primary care, et cetera, um, uh, the recommendation is for them to wear appropriate PPE, like when they're doing swabbing. However, there is limited um, uh, PrEP available for people that are working, for instance, in STI clinics, where they're doing the direct and routine swabbing um, on a regular basis. Um, so we have given PrEP doses for people that work in STI clinics where they're routinely swabbing lesions, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Some vaccine considerations. Um, because of documented risk of myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccines and the unknown risk for myocarditis with Genios, people may consider waiting four weeks after Genios before receiving an mRNA COVID vaccine, particularly adolescent or young adult males. Um, MPX vaccine is recommended for prophylaxis in the setting of an outbreak and shouldn't be delayed because of receipt of a COVID vaccine. So in terms of PEP, if somebody is recommended to get um, MPX vaccine, if it, uh, Genios for PEP, um, whether or not they've had a recent COVID vaccine, we should still go forward with the Genios. Some additional considerations, um, again, administered as, as two injections four weeks apart. We're seeing quite a bit, people get their first injection, they feel they're, protect, they're protected after that. Not the case. The maximum protection is, uh, comes in two weeks after the, the, the second dose. May be familiar um, in terms of you know, what we're seeing with COVID vaccines as well. Persons exposed to MPX virus and who have not received the smallpox vaccine within the last this three years should uh, consider getting vaccinated. So um, we get that question. If somebody had the smallpox vaccine when they were younger, does that protect them? If they were exposed and their vaccine was on the past three years, they should consider getting that vaccine again. Uh, people with minor illnesses like a cold may still be vaccinated. Um, and in particularly, um, uh, that, whether that's PEP or, or PrEP, but people who are moderately or severely ill um, should usually wait until they recover before getting a routine PrEP dose. However, for PEP, PEP should be administered regardless of concurring illnesses, pregnancy, breastfeeding, or weakened immune system. They should still get the post-exposure prophylaxis. We don't wait until they get better. 
Vaccination is not considered effective after a person is already experiencing MPX symptoms like a rash. Let's talk a little about the intradermal option. So some of you might have heard of, well, now we have this option to um, give the injection no longer as uh, just subdermal, but also intradermal. Um, and that was authorized on August 9th by the FDA. The injection volume is 0.1 milliliters as compared to the 0.5. So the thought is, well, we could potentially get five times the amount of doses. Some um, thoughts around that. Since it's a multi-dose vial, and often when drying up the vaccine, there could be a, a bit that gets spilled over, our anticipation is we might not get those full, full five doses out, out of each vial. It might be somewhere around four. In addition, there are some people that are not able to get the intradermal pathway. Uh, kids, still, those under the age of 18, should still be getting the subdermal vaccine. Um, and individuals that are at risk for keloiding, they should still be getting the subdermal vaccine. This is based off of a, uh, the switch to uh, uh, intradermal is based off of a clinical study that showed uh, the lower intradermal dose was Im immunologically non-inferior to the standard subcutaneous dose. I cited the study here in case people wanna read a little bit more about that. Study was um, uh, around 500 people, around 160 people in each arm. Not a huge study. However, um, the thought is this, looking specifically at the intradermal for monkeypox, for the Genios vaccine, in addition to past literature that we have supporting the intradermal route for other vaccines, together that evidence base helps to support that this also um, should be an effective um, uh, way of vaccinating. Um, the intradermal administration involves injecting the vaccine superficially between the epidermis and hypodermis layers of the skin, typically volar aspect or the inner side of the forearm, uh, should produce a noticeable pale elevation of the skin or the wheel. Think of the TB, you know, skin tests. It should look like that. Same area, a sim similar kind of deal. Person who presents for their second Genios vaccine dose is still experiencing erythema or, or in duration at the site of the intradermal in administration for the first vaccine dose, can have the second dose administered intradermally in the contralateral or forearm, the other arm. Um, key point on this, but in studies, when they looked at a side effect profile from this vaccine, 100% uh, reported side effect being redness uh, on that arm. So we need to prepare patients that if we're getting the intradermal injection, it is it is anticipated that they will get some redness and potentially swelling in that area to not be alarmed um, by that. Um, and then that is a, a normal part of the vaccine. Um, so setting expectations. Um, when necessary, person aged 18 years or older receives a new vaccine dose with a standard subcutaneous regimen for their first dose, they can get the second dose as an intradermal. There's no problem with that. Um, and then similarly, if somebody is you know, less than 18 before the first dose, then for, and they get their subcutaneous after 18, they can then get the, sub, the, the intradermal for their second dose. Uh, like I said, children, young adults under the age of 18 should still get the subdermal. Now it's under EUA, makes it easier for us to, to do that. People who are prone to keloids should be considered for subdermal. More information um, below, which um, went into um, this, the study, some of the FDA guidance, CDC guidance. They also have a video on how to administer an intradermal um, vaccine. So uh, some good resources down there. Vaccine prioritization. So in terms of the county, how are we prioritizing vaccines? So we're currently prioritizing first doses of vaccine for people who have been identified by known MPX cases as intimate or otherwise close contacts with a person diagnosed with MPX. That's our PEP. Um, we have here our PrEP, which is our specific lab workers who are directly processing lab specimens um, or healthcare prof professionals who regularly, uh, who work regularly in SDI clinic environments directly and routinely performing MPX testing. Um, and then here is more community um, related. People who have had a bacterial STI, syphilis or gonorrhea in the last three months among people who identify as gay, bisexual, or cisgender men who have sex with men or non-binary persons assigned male at birth who have sex with men or transgender persons who have sex with men. People engage in transactional sex or survival sex, um, like sex in exchange for shelter, food, or other goods or needs. People who work at a sex club, bathhouse, or sauna. And then also a consideration for people with immunocompromising conditions um, who, um, uh, who might be at elevated risk uh, based off of also um, sexual or gender identity, um, like people with HIV. So we have that prioritization uh, listed on our website, um, along with uh, on our vaccine locations. Website has the priority levels, and then also locations that are doing vaccines. For our PEP and PrEP strategy in public health, um, 
PEP con continues to be prioritized from the federal state level and also for us too, um, as well as uh, um, some limited um, PrEP or what, what's being called the PEP++. Plus plus. Um, so within public health, we're keeping back around 25 doses to help with home vaccination, vaccine clinics, like for sex workers and outbreak response. But the majority of our doses are being pushed out to community partners. Um, um, and they're uh, doing the PEP++ plus plus or really, you know, what's, what's con the, the, the PrEP, it's pre-exposure for people that might be at higher risk. CDC is referring to it as a PEP++. Plus plus. And that's based on the prioritization uh, guidance. The different locations. So we are also working and hoping to get vaccines soon into our UHS. We will be helping to um, uh, it, uh, make those referrals off of our vaccine interest form. So this is the vaccine interest form. Um, so on our website, you'll see also uh, you know, a, a, a link there for the vaccine interest form. And this is where patients can fill out their information if they're interested in a vaccine. Um, they put in some basic demographic data, um, their, their contact information, and then um, uh, ask questions about the risk factors. And then we pull people off that list and schedule them for visits. Um, we'll be doing that with um, the RUHS um, locations um, and also helping to assist if, uh, if healthcare providers within uh, RUHS have, have patients that meet criteria, uh, as helping to um, assist them to get into, into that list. Prevention strategies. <laughs> and I'm just checking how I'm doing on time. Okay, we're running a little short. I will, <laughs> this is the last section. <laughs> um, so what we're telling patients, always talk to your sexual partners about any recent illness, be aware of new unexplained sores or rashes, including on genitals or anus, avoid close contact, including sex, kissing, or cuddling with people with symptoms like sores or rashes, isolation of persons with MPX symptoms until, uh, including a rash, um, uh, until all symptoms, including rash, have completely gone away, practicing good hand hygiene, using uh, appropriate PPE, avoiding contact with infected materials, and then some guidance on safer sex and social gatherings. So this talks through um, some of the things that would be higher risk or lower risk. It's based off of the CDC guidance, um, and it, it gives some specific strategies that you can use in counseling patients in terms of harm reduction um, that might be at risk. So things like taking a break from activities that might increase exposure to MPX uh, until they've been vaccinated or limiting the number of sex partners or anonymous sex partners. Um, uh, and it, it gets into some other more specific guidance um, uh, as well as uh, you know, washing um, uh, uh, any of the, the sex toys or things like that, fetish gear that they might be using. Um, and so it, it, it's, uh, there's a flyer that's, that's linked on, on here. It's also on our website that might be, able, uh, might be helpful for patients that are in that, those highest risk group, groups in order to have those you know, one-on-one -on -one, you know, conversations about harm, harm reduction. Current risk level per CDPH is still considered to be low for the general public. And, and though not exclusively, recent cases have included gay, bisexual, and other men and transgender people of sex with men and household contacts. That seems to be uh, the group that is um, uh, that has had most of the cases at this point. But of course, anyone can get MPX. And it's important to recognize and eliminate stigma when discussing MPX while also accurately addressing the risk uh, in populations most affected. This is just showing casing some of our public health community outreach through canvassing in the community, community group presentations, uh, presentations like this one, <laughs> community town halls, uh, community leader updates, uh, video updates, social media posting, um, and we have more flyers on our website. And we're telling patients that if they believe that they've been exposed, that they should contact their healthcare provider, healthcare providers, um, and uh, our UHS, in addition to other facilities across the county, are really um, a, a core backbone of our monkeypox response and our ability to be able to treat patients and then also prevent the spread. Resources, Q&A, and I apologize that I went over. <laughs> Dr. Shavinsky, thank you for that whirlwind tour of MPX and what we're doing here. You know, it's funny because I had a, a, a list of questions that I wanted to ask, but with every slide, you're answering all of them. So. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that worked out pretty well. Uh, with that being said, we only do have two questions in our uh, chat here. So first one off is uh, Dr. Jukaku is asking, do you recommend having a questionnaire like the COVID questionnaire before coming into these healthcare settings? Ah, so like to, to, to screen and understand whether or not they might have MPX coming in. I think I think it, it, it's something um, to, to consider. I think uh, each institution might consider that. Um, uh, whether that works for their, their workflow, but I, I certainly um, uh, makes sense as numbers are increasing or as we see uh, higher um, incidents asking those questions. If you're already asking COVID questions, it 
it makes sense what you know to, to consider adding those as well um, to help prepare and, and and to then know how to room and, and to take the, the proper precautions it certainly makes sense as an approach and i'll check in with our operations team to see where they fit in i i feel like that's already part of our screener so dr jukaku and the rest of our group i'll i'll get that information um, we do have one last question from edwin rojas he's asking is testing in TPOX free for patients that don't have insurance and or are non-citizens? Yeah, that's a great question too. TPOX, so I'll, I'll handle the one that's easier first and then I'll go to the one that's a little bit more challenging. TPOX, TPOX is free. It's coming from the national stockpile and then it comes to public health and then we're, we're, we're dispensing that out or we're sending it to facilities to dispense. That should be free for patients that um, whether they don't have insurance or whether or not they're, they're citizens. And if that was ever, uh, you know, a trouble, we certainly would help with, with that component to, 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 you know, help with facilitating or work through the CHCs. The testing component, now that one's a little bit more challenging because um, there are some potential costs that are built in. Um, one, healthcare provider visit, there might be a cost associated based off of the facility. Um, and so that's not something that's um, in public health necessarily hands, um, uh, as well as the commercial lab testing, the commercial labs charge for the tests. So that is each institution is, is working um, through their policies to address that. I think that's a very important um, uh, a point, and that's also why um, we've engaged um, the CHCs, which is one of our key providers in the county to help provide services to those that are either uninsured or underinsured. That is why we've been knocking at your doorstep and begging to help us with the testing is because of that potential gap of, of people that otherwise might not be able to get services elsewhere and where the cost might be prohibitive. Um, so uh, thank you for raising that question. And it's certainly something that's on the top of our minds. And we did get one last uh, question. Um, Erico from uh, Lake Elsinore is asking, what is recommended uh, to use for disinfection of surfaces, alcohol-based, bleach? So I have that in the infection prevention uh, slides. And so I can follow up with some of those um, links. It's also on the CDC website. Let me see if I can get that for you. Um, let's see. So it would be from this slide. So perhaps we can um, uh, follow up with you and, and get you that information about the, the, the proper disinfection of, um, of surfaces. Thank you, Dr. Javinsky. And um, we'll definitely have our operations team share this information uh, with our um, audience members. So uh, with that being said, it is time. Dr. Shavinsky, we just want to thank you again for joining us at the RUHS Innovations webinar. Um, if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Shavinsky. Um, you can reach out to myself and I'll make sure to uh, pass any questions on to her. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shavinsky. Sure. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you again next month at our next